Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 promises to shed light on Rocket Raccoon, whom James Gunn has called the secret protagonist of the series. So in this video, I'm gonna do a character breakdown to shine a spotlight on this trash panda and break down at least, I don't know, 20 key facts about this guy that we don't talk about enough and make a case for why he really is the secret protagonist or really not that secret leader of this franchise and why we shouldn't get our faces scratched up or calling him a Rocket Raccoon, even though there's still a lot about him we don't know. You don't know anything about me, loser. Okay, so in the MCU, we first meet Rocket in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 on the planet Xandar, and right off the bat, this guy clearly hates humanoids. Xandarians, what a bunch of losers. All of them in a big hurry to get from something stupid to nothing at all. And as explored in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, don't worry, no spoilers in this video, this hatred comes from a backstory with the high evolutionary Herbert Wyndham, who cruelly experimented on this patient, 89P13, along with others like Lila, Floor, and Teefs. Rocket is actually one of the most sensitive characters in the MCU, forming bonds despite himself and feeling lost more deeply because of everything he suffered in this past. The Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy is Rocket's hero's journey. Gunn has said Volume 1 is about the mother, Volume 2 is about the father, and Volume 3 is about the self, and that self is very much Rocket and his pain. He spends most of his time in the MCU in denial that he's a raccoon, and the running joke is that no one quite knows what he is. So I ain't about to be brought down by a tree and a talking raccoon. Can I pet your puppy? It is adorable. Hey there, rat! Rabbit is correct and clearly the smartest among you. Rat? Yeah, that's how eyesight works, you stupid raccoon. Don't call me a raccoon! I'm sorry. I took it too far. I meant Trash Panda. Honestly, until this exact second, I thought you were Build-A-Bear. Maybe I am. Even that triangle-faced monkey there. And while this is played for humor, it seems like Rocket doesn't find this very funny. Keep <sighs> calling me vermin, tough guy! He thinks I'm some stupid thing! He does! Well, I didn't ask to get made! I didn't ask to be torn apart and put back together over and over and turned into some, some little monster. And so this bitterness toward other bipedal humanoids is where we find Rocket and Xandar in Volume 1 having teamed up with Groot as a bounty hunter duo trying to capture Peter Quill for Yondu and getting arrested and processed by the Nova Corps, where we get a fascinating rap sheet for the character. Subject 89P13 calls itself Rocket the result of illegal genetic and cybernetic experiments on a lower life form. And let's zoom in and enhance on this. We see subject 89P13, alias Rocket, origin half-world, which is also his origin in the comics, where animal-like test subjects live. His length is listed as 144 microbules, height 168 grets, legs two, arms two, and then we see enhancements, cybernetic skeletal structure, enhanced phalange and metacarpal bones, genetically augmented cerebral cortex, so this explains why he's so smart, and how we can also take so much physical abuse because of his cybernetic skeleton. He's kind of like a rocket version of Wolverine. Ain't no thing like me except me. But back to the screen, we see associates Groot and Lila. Lila, of course, is Rocket's otter-like soulmate from the comics who we're gonna meet in Guardians Volume 3. We also see his criminal record, 13 counts of theft, 22 counts of escape from incarceration, seven counts of mercenary activity, 15 counts of arson, and then we get a warning tendency to bite. Hey, there's a lot of this on this shirt I'm wearing. You can actually get this at nerdriot.shop, by the way. But this tendency to bite is hilarious because earlier when we saw Gamora bite him, he said, Biting? That's not fair. And also in Guardians Volume 2, when Mantis pets him, he bites her, which makes Drax crack up. Rocket also brings up his prison escape record later with a lot of pride. I ain't gonna be here long. I've escaped 22 prisons. This one's no different. Which brings up perhaps the most impressive maneuver in the entire Volume 1 film, the way Rocket escapes from the kiln. So by the way, we gotta up that escape number to 23. Rocket details his complicated plan, which requires many things, including... I need his prosthetic leg. But it turns out, not really. Oh, I was just kidding about the leg. I just need these two things. What? No, I, th I thought it'd be funny. Was it funny? But this is very important to Rocket. It actually kicks off a running bit about Rocket being obsessed with stealing fake limbs and parts. That guy's eye. No, seriously, I need it. It's, it's important to me. But leave the eye here. Why? He's gonna wake up tomorrow and he's not gonna know where his eye is. <laughs> What's this? What's it look like? Some jerk lost a bet with me in Contraxia. Okay, how much for the arm? 
Oh, I'll get that arm. And yeah, he totally does get this arm as a Christmas present in the Guardians holiday special. Lucky's arm? Christmas. But back in Boy 1, during the kill and escape, he inverts the gravity outside the guard booth like a Superman 2 Fortress of Solitude move and then uses the security drones to tote the booth out of there, which is pure brilliance. And it showed how inventive and improvisational that genetically augmented cerebral cortex is. The guy can make a last minute escape out of a box of scraps. Rather than Tony Stark just doing it once, Rocket does it again and again and again, pretty much every time we see him in the MCU. He's also super heroic. Just watch volume one. The guy is the unabashed hero of the story. He's ready to save Peter from the Ravagers. He blasts a hole in the Dark Aster ship so the others can get in. He shoots down Necrocraft over water on Xandar so they don't crash into civilians. Xandarians said he started this movie talking shit about, and then he kamikazes the warship to bring it down. And when his best friend sacrifices himself, we see the inner humanity of this trash panda. I call him an idiot. Groot's sacrifice in this moment is likely what inspires Rocket to step up and join in with the rest of the team as they take over the Power Stone. We see him reach up his little paw to take Drax's hand. Remember, he started this movie hunting Quill for money and is ready to sacrifice him for, as we heard earlier, the only friends we ever had. And as they defeat Ronan, we get this moment where Rocket is cradling a stick from Groot and Drax puts his hand on his head to pet him. And Rocket, who normally hates anytime anyone does this, tenses up but gives in and allows himself to be comforted, as you can see, by his tail relaxing. But he replants the Groot stick, and at the end of the movie, we get Baby Groot, Groot's son. Music has always been such an important part of the Guardians of the Galaxy films, and Nerd Riot's new Awesome Mix merch collection has taken that idea and run with it. They have mashed up iconic album art with the Guardians themselves. It's the perfect gear to wear opening weekend or while rocking out in your daily life. Never mind whether or not you grew up on grunge, you could get Grunge Groot. But if all the stars have you feeling more like Ziggy Stardust, then the Ziggy Star-Lord T might be what you need. If you like Dark Side of the moon, then you'll love this Dark Side of the Galaxy T. Meanwhile, I'm rocking my all-time favorite rock album, Rumors by Fleetwood Mac, because I can never break the chain. And I'm wearing this Rumors-inspired Ravagers shirt. Highly recommend you grab one. Shopping at Nerd Riot is one of the best ways to support our channel. And in addition to tons more Guardians merch, you can find merch inspired by the MCU, Star Wars, DC, all your favorite fandoms. To get your hands on the merch you need, head to nerdriot.shop today Join the riot over at nerdriot.shop. In Guardians Volume 2, Rocket is just as stubborn and dickish and reckless as ever, but we see even more of that vulnerability underneath it all. It's as if the more he opens himself up to love with this found family, the more he has to offset that. In this case, by pointlessly stealing the Anilax batteries that lead to the Guardians being pursued by Aisha and the Sovereign, a problem that is still chasing them in Volume 3 with Adam Warlock. The Guardians meet Ego, Will's evil dad, and Aisha sends the Ravagers after them. Rocket is so sad when Peter chooses to split the party, with some of them going to Ego's planet and some of them staying behind, he's probably feeling separation anxiety like a puppy when he's left home alone. Can I pet your puppy? It is adorable. Yes. <laughs> and notice how, while the others leave, Rocket repairs the ship with the Spray 3D printer, which Gunn has tweeted is a special technology that takes an insane amount of focus and detail orientation to use, showing how Rocket has, in the past, taken the time to map out a perfect layout of the ship. He never wants it to change. He is obsessed with the details. And then after this, he lays the perfect trap for the Ravagers. Uh. <laughs> He anticipated the Ravagers coming, and he lured them in by humming Glen Campbell's Southern Nights through the radio to make them think he was on the ship. But nope, he hilariously bounces them around with these gravity snares. Rocket bonds with Yondu in this movie on the Ravager ship, and Yondu gives us our first hint to the High Evolutionary's backstory in Volume 3. I know them scientists what made you never gave a rat's ass about you. A super important line, because not only does it show that Yondu knows who the High Evolutionary was, and everything the High Evolutionary does is pretty publicly known in the galaxy, and that everyone just kind of looks the other way, for these two characters, Yondu paints he and Rocket as parallel figures. They steal shit they don't need, they're short-tempered. What kind of a pair are we? And so when Yondu sacrifices himself in the third act of this movie, we see how it really takes a toll on Rocket. I'm sorry. I can only afford to lose one friend today. And during Yondu's funeral, Rocket slips up and conflates Yondu's flaws with his own. He didn't chase him away. Even though he yelled at him, I was always mean. And he stole batteries he didn't need bringing us to this volume two final shot with Cat Stevens, I know I have to go, on Rocket's tear streak face in particular. Knowing how hard it is for Rocket to lose Guardians makes it even more painful when he loses Groot in Infinity War. Oh God. Oh. No, 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 no. By the way, James Gunn later confirmed that that final I am Groot translated to 
daddy. And you know how Rocket heard that loud and clear. In Avengers Endgame, Rocket is reunited with Nebula, and there's a moment where he pats Nebula's hand. Again, a big gesture for him, since the guy isn't big on physical contact, but still, they grasp hands together in their grief. Remember, while the other Guardians were dusted, these two stayed on Earth for five years during the blip. You could say they have the most history together, and so it makes sense to see them rise up in this leadership status in Volume 3. But throughout Endgame, Rocket wears Peter's red scarf, just another indicator of how much he loves and misses him. Rocket ends up helping out with a time heist, going to Asgard with Thor, who is a mess in this movie, much to Rocket's disgust. You think you're the only one who lost people? What do you think we're doing here? I lost the only family I ever had. Quill, Groot, Drax, the chick with the antenna, all gone. And when they finally succeed in getting everyone back who was snapped away, we see how unwilling Rocket is to lose that family again when he shields Groot with his body during the final battle in Thanos' onslaught. Rocket makes brief appearances in Thor Love and Thunder in I Am Groot, fighting alongside Thor on various planets including Indigar, and being one guardian other than Baby Groot to appear in I Am Groot, receiving Groot's magnum opus art project. Why are you handing me this? What is this, war trash? Oh, look how big you are. Oh, this is very nice. Now we gotta get this frame. Put up the uh, top of the fridge. I can't stay mad at you, can I? And finally, he shows up in the Guardians holiday special after the Guardians have bought nowhere from the Collector. Rocket works with Cosmo, the space dog, to fix some damage done by the Power Stone in the past, or maybe by Thanos sacking this place to get the Reality Stone. Cosmo, what use is telekinesis if you can't even aim? And we see him get pissed at Kevin Bacon. Dude, calm down. I'm not gonna hurt you. That's a talking raccoon. I'll kill you! Don't ever hey! call me that! Yeah, remember, he wasn't offended before he knew what a raccoon was, but now that he knows, anytime anyone calls him a raccoon, he goes off. It is his biggest trigger. And so, from this biographical breakdown, what do we know about Rocket on the eve of Volume 3? Well, tragic backstory as an experiment by the High Evolutionary, experiments that, based on Yondu knowing it was scientists who made him, were publicly known to many in the galaxy. Rocket has a bitterness toward normal humanoid society and an appreciation for quote-unquote monsters and broken things. He's all bark and all bite, but ultimately a big softy. And, most importantly, truly, one of the smartest engineering brains in the MCU. Hey, thanks for watching this character breakdown of Rocket. You can subscribe to our new channel, The Deep Dive, where this Friday, May 5th at noon Eastern, I'll be doing a live stream Q&A and live breakdown of volume three. You can support this growing network by grabbing something from our merch store, nerdriot.shop. Support new rock stars on YouTube and on all social platforms. You can follow me at EA Voss. Thanks for watching, bye.